welcome to this special webinar in wake of uh, the public health and economic challenge which uh, the coronavirus disease and covid-19 has uh, posed to not only india but also globally and um, so we have two senior infectious disease experts dr r sajit kumar this is a very respected name in not only in field of uh, hiv but many other infectious diseases and now with covid-19 he has been uh, on the front lines uh, in kerala he was among the first doctors who began hiv care in kerala state when first case got diagnosed in the state and uh, he is the professor and head of infectious disease department at uh, kottayam medical college of the government in kerala state and in, in india the first cases got di- of covid coronavirus disease got diagnosed in kerala dr trupti gilada bahiti is amongst us she is infectious disease expert from mumbai from unison medicare and research center dr trupti gilada is an infectious disease expert but has been involved with hiv response since several several years as well so uh, both of you are here and the video we saw of public education and health promotion on coronavirus in hindi language was uh, also of dr trupti so if you have any questions we can take it in the uh, open session before we uh, you know speak to our panelists uh, let me there are two housekeeping announcements one is the those of you who are watching on zoom you can use the chat box to type in your question or raise your virtual hand and uh, those of you who are watching on facebook live you can leave your comment in the comment box and uh, we will try to take as many comments as possible in this one hour with these two experts so uh, so so welcome again dr sajit kumar and dr trupti dr sajit kumar please tell us corona virus as such is not new we have heard about it and uh, but novel corona virus which is causing the covid 19 disease is new so please help us understand the signs and uh, the public health challenge it is posing so over to you sir. yeah yeah thank you see the issue is uh, uh, human beings have been in this uh, earth for a pretty long time but viruses have uh, come much before us so they have their own ways of uh, surviving in this world much more efficient than uh, human beings and uh, you know there are lots and lots of viruses which have been uh, identified and actually uh, identified which are uh, leading a very comfortable peaceful uh, existence with uh, animals comfortably staying in their uh, bodies without producing any disease in them and uh, perhaps a countless number of organisms are there in the animal and bird bodies particularly in the mammals and birds all over the world and uh, it in fact uh, you know the corona virus has been identified as one of the uh, animal viruses for a pretty long time and uh, interactions with this uh, the, the so called virus trajectory which is actually living uh, very comfortably with these mammals and birds is sometimes uh, you know trespassed by human beings and that is when you know, the viruses get a chance to infect the human beings and generally these viruses have a tendency to be confined to the animals and birds uh, and therefore there even if a few viruses enter human body that's not going to produce a very serious disease but unfortunately you know in between as all of us know the viruses have got a tendency to change its characteristics as far as the uh, the morphology is concerned as far as the genetic uh, makeup is concerned and also as far as the infectivity is concerned and you know when one of these viruses uh, or a group of viruses get a change which facilitates its survival in the human body that is when you get uh, actually the human cases so that is perhaps the the, the initial stage where uh, the viruses undergo some transformation some change which makes them vulnerable to infect human beings and you know if by that time if uh, a, a, a human being or a cluster of human beings happens to be in the trajectory they get infected and the unfortunate thing is uh, our bodies are not uh, really equipped for various reasons related to immunity and other things our bodies are not equipped to handle these viruses and uh, in most instances they they will be associated this, this uh, passing of the viruses into the human body will be associated with large number of people developing serious illness and dying but uh, the, the 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 contention that we had in the initial days was that generally these viruses tend to occur in small clusters in very small parts of the world and generally uh, they do not spread that fast even if it spreads fast it gets limited in a 
very small geographical area so that large number of people are not usually affected but uh, the viruses produce a large number of deaths in those small population that was the usual tendency all the time and it was uh, sometime in uh, 2002 that we had actually the major problem with the corona virus the corona virus uh, being recognized in a morphologically under the electron microscope as a virus with you know radiating uh, a corona around its uh, uh, the round contour and that was the time when we had the SARS epidemic which again had its origin in China and then it went over to a, a few countries but uh, mostly limited to people who were traveling frequently. The viruses you know uh, which are actually limited to a geographical area as we said earlier are uh, not able to cross or uh, you know travel large distances and infect other people around but it's a human BD human bodies, you know, human beings, ourselves, which carry these organisms around. And our first experience with these viruses was uh, during the SARS epidemic, when people traveling internationally through the flights, they were carrying the virus to different countries and continents. And that was way back in 2002, almost 20 years back. And then uh, they killed a large number of people. I'm not going to the you know, actual numbers and statistics, which is available everywhere right now. And then uh, after about 10 years, we had the issue of... Uh, Another similar virus coming up, which is called the MERS virus, that is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And uh, whereas the, the palm civets uh, or the toady cats were responsible, were considered as responsible for the SARS epidemic in 2002, in 2012, when we had the MERS epidemic, you know, to be frank, that epidemic is still continuing. 2002, when we had that problem, it was actually the virus which came, uh, which was expected to come from the uh, the camels that created the problem. And, you know, we were reasonably comfortable that we are not going to get another uh, epidemic soon. And most probably, you know, people were expecting that it will happen in 2022. But the, this year, uh, you know, it was in 2019 that uh, the, the, the virus again started creating havoc. Basically, so this is a virus which is uh, uh, very comfortable with animal and bird uh, beings, living comfortably there, you know, living in synchronization with their... Uh, bodies but when it comes to human beings that is when it's trouble and human beings as a, as, a, as a species we are not equipped to handle this type of viruses easily and then the transmissibility also becomes a problem large number of people become infected very fast and uh, you know i think this is what i would like to share about the, the virus as such you know in the beginning of the discussion thank you yeah uh, thank you, Dr. Sidhik Kumar, for this, uh, you know, overview. Uh, uh, Shimona Kanwar has sent in a question that why is it scarier than previous pandemics? So uh, maybe we li li can listen to responses from both of you, Dr. Tripti and Dr. Sidhik Kumar. So maybe, uh, Dr. Tripti, you would like to go first? No? Why uh, is it scarier than previous pandemics? Uh, so what happened, what happened differently with novel coronaviruses that although the mortality with the virus isn't very high, it is a highly infectious virus. And um, is it possible for me to share screen and just show a few things so that it yeah, becomes yeah, of easy? Of course. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You, you will see a share button on your screen. I, I did it. I'm just trying to. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see the screen now? Yes, yes, we can yeah, see yeah. your slides. Yeah. Yeah. I think you can switch on to the PowerPoint show. I am, I am. Yeah. So, uh, to specifically answer the question about why is it so much more riskier. So, if you see this, this is actually a slide from almost 20 days back. At that point, we had around 80,000 cases. We are, in the last 20 days, we've almost crossed twice that number. We are at 1,70,000 today. But what I wanted to show you is that just in a span of two months, we had this huge peak surge of number of cases with, and, uh, with COVID versus these other pandemics that we had earlier, which probably spanned, and these figures are spanning over a few months, four or five months that they lasted. And even, though, even with that four or five months, they did not have as many cases as COVID had with Shut us, uh, such a short 
span of time and the red bars is the mortality so what is evident is that the mortality is definitely lower than a lot of other pandemics that we've seen compared to ebola where the mortality rate or the case fatality rate was 50% so it is scary because it's highly infectious but at the same time we need to understand that it isn't a panic situation we only need to tackle this understanding all these figures and all these numbers well does it answer the question yes yes that's great yeah dr sajit kumar would you like to add something yeah yeah i'm here yes so sir will you like to add something why is it scarier than previous pandemics uh, or or should we move on now uh, see compared to the previous pandemics you can't say that this is going to be the scariest of all the pandemics we had more severe pandemic before also uh, the issue here is it's actually the human beings you know which carry the viruses all around and uh, you know what could have been or what should have been uh, contained as an epidemic perhaps in the wuhan city or perhaps uh, only in china uh, now it has become a, uh, a, a something which is intercontinental and which has crossed all boundaries right now so that's where you know uh, we must say that uh, the human uh, human kind or perhaps the, the whole uh, human uh, the people on the world failed training the epidemic the uh, the virus has got a tendency to spread faster and especially when the people don't have immunity the people are not exposed to this type of viruses in large numbers prior to the epidemic there's always a tendency that the viruses will try to survive and the survival of the virus is basically by spreading to other human beings and uh, the infectivity is one major part about the viruses you know which uh, requires a lot of detailed analysis why some viruses tend to spread faster and some viruses tend to spread uh, rather slow See, but the issue is if a, if if a community or if, a, if the human population as such is not exposed to this virus before at all there is a high tendency that it might spread faster in fact the transmission rate of coronavirus is not that high as it is in the case of many other viruses for example all of us know that you know measles virus spreads faster than coronavirus but then A, a large number of people in the in the in the large number of uh, you know uh, human beings in the population is already immune to this so there is naturally uh, a decrease in the number of susceptible people who are going to be there who can catch the disease but here that is not the situation and then another thing is uh, you know generally the viruses which infect human beings which has got a very large tendency to spread faster like your common cold viruses they they are not that lethal or they do not produce that much mortality The, the unfortunate combination happens when you have a virus which spreads faster and has got a higher mortality so that is exactly why you know we are worried about this particular virus now which we know that it has got a reasonably uh, you know serious uh, lethal effects on certain kinds of people and at the same time it has got a tendency to spread very fast so that is why we are worried about this and uh, you know uh, probably the major thing that is uh, influencing the spread right now is that our populations are not immune to this right 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 so you you very right and who director general also emphasized on the whole of government approach and not just of health ministry and uh, yeah yeah uh, and, and so another thing another thing that, which we must not yeah. forget is actually you know uh, the, the 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 preponderance of international travel that is happening nowadays you know the millions of people are on the sky all the time actually if you look at some of those you know the, right. the high radar apps you will be surprised it's the traffic on the air is so high and people are traveling in such a way that you know they can they can travel uh, all around the globe within no time and and literally you know these people are carrying the viruses and there is practically no way by which you can identify a person whether he is carrying the virus or not that is a major problem with uh, again the viral infections so all these are right. that, yeah so uh, so while we are talking to you dr sajit kumar can you also please share uh, how the about the kerala experience and uh, uh, what is happening in kerala uh, in terms of diagnosing contact tracing medical management infection control for healthcare workers for example 
or yeah. public yeah. education can we know yeah. more about that uh, yeah. yeah thank See, you definitely kerala has been a different state as far as the health parameters and the health scenario is concerned compared not only to the rest of india but to the rest of the world and uh, you know the, the the moment we realized that uh, uh, china is having a problem with corona virus our first thought process was that probably we are not have, going to have a major problem because china is so far away and there are not, not that many you know people coming uh, from china every day so that is our impression but when we actually is, you know uh, started looking at it we found that there are lots of people who are there in china uh, in, in 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 different capacities and a good number of them uh, from kerala were actually students because kerala people you know generally they are uh, so much uh, you know committed to getting higher education anywhere in the world a number of medical students paramedical students and other types of students were studying in china and we also came to know that you know some of them have actually landed in kerala even before we took note of the situation and that was when we you know our first alert was to identify all those people who have come from china particularly wuhan and uh, immediately within about uh, 24 to 48 hours we could locate uh, a few medical students who were actually studying in the same institution where these cases were being handled and then you know the the administration and uh, uh, the the health missionary started acting very fast uh, in fact uh, we were one of the few states in the country uh, to immediately quarantine all those people who came from uh, wuhan and the rest of china and uh, within uh, no time we started screening also and we could detect about three medical students at that time in three different parts of the of the state who were all exposed to this uh, virus and they were all home for uh, their uh, new year vacation holidays the chinese new year as all of you know is actually a little later than 1st of january so they were here uh, and for the vacation and then uh, you know fortunately we could identify uh, all the all the wuhan returnees and all wuhan returnees were subjected to uh, quarantine measures uh, that means they were all uh, you know literally closed up in their rooms in their houses and they were not they were asked not to go out and their all contacts were traced immediately and uh, actually it was a very small number that time so it was quite easy to do that job but we did it very rigorously and all the three were immediately shifted to uh, very well contained uh, isolation rooms in medical college hospitals in three parts of the state and not only that you know almost all the contacts were traced within no time and uh, the other thing is uh, you know the, our policy that was that you know we were testing everybody who came from wuhan because at that time we were also worried about you know asymptomatic people carrying the virus to this to the to the society and then all the contacts were also tested and screened and uh, you know fortunately we could uh, see that all the three of them uh, were cured and they went out from the hospitals and not a single person in kerala was infected by any three of them so that was the first uh, experience you know which prompted us uh, you know to believe that probably something can be done and the, the disease can be contained But unfortunately as all of you know after a gap of a few days now uh, we started uh, getting cases coming from other parts of the world in fact uh, there is a saying that you know any part of the world you go you will find a malayali there a kerala uh, studying or working there and and they also have this habit that you know just like any other indian uh, population they have the habit that when they become sick they always come back to the hometown so we found that lot of people from other places were coming over to kerala uh, even after they noticed that they were becoming sick and uh, you know we have four uh, international airports and all four international airports are uh, flooded with people coming from various countries mostly you know through uh, after transit through one of the gulf countries they land up here and we were all watching you know something might happen because italy also is a place where there are a lot of uh, airlines working there in various capacities so that was when you know we were taken by surprise uh, that in spite of all the measures which we were adopting to control uh, the 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 foreign returnees or the international travelers bringing the disease to the state we found that uh, our airport mechanisms could not filter everybody and uh, and because people were uh, asymptomatic that time the filtering in the airport was only to look whether they are coming from china 
or whether they are having some fever. So we use the thermometers to see whether they are having fever and we ask people to fill out the forms, uh, asking them about their travel history and all those things. Unfortunately, uh, at some stage, this did not help us. Uh, uh, and you now uh, one family of uh, three members who came from Italy, they uh, somehow, you know, we miss them. We don't blame them for their, mis their misdeeds, but, uh, you know, we miss them. And then actually we realized that these people have brought coronavirus to the state only when one of their contacts developed the disease. And this contact, when he went to a hospital, a doctor, the doctor asked the history whether he had gone abroad. And then he said, I did not go abroad, but one of my relatives had gone abroad and they, they had come back and now I had some contact with them. And that was when you know, everything was triggered. And we found that this particular uh, family uh, had uh, around seven people who were uh, infected. And two of them being very elderly, the eldest being 93 years old. And uh, the youngest being a child with four, who was four years old. So we had a cluster of cases by now. And that was when, you know, the system was uh, actually, you know, uh, uh, was shocked to find that this has happened uh, even in spite of all these things. And so we intensified all our measures. And right now what we're doing is, you know, when whenever anybody who is coming from outside is spotted, he is immediately asked to go for quarantine. Initially, we had identified the, the, the countries like China, Italy, Iran, uh, Korea, South Korea, uh, Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, etc. But subsequently, we realized that there is no point in doing that. So almost anybody coming from any other country who is landing here is now asked to be in quarantine. And quarantine literally means, as most of us know, is that the person has to be uh, in a room, uh, not even permitted to move in the house uh, in, uh, with them and mix with other people. So he has to be in a room, uh, sitting alone, and all his food and other requirements will be given there. And uh, even if he becomes sick, he is not permitted to come out of the room on his own. So we ask him, you know, if he develops some problems in the 14 days when he is under observation. In fact, we are we are asking people to stay for 28 days in Kerala because we don't want to take a risk. So if if he happens to be sick, he is not supposed to even come out of the room. He is supposed because everybody is carrying mobile phones these days. So he is, uh, you know, regularly uh, interviewed by the health people about his health. And then if he becomes sick. He has to call a local health authority who will arrange for the transport of this person out of his room. And then only he'll, that, that way he will be taken in an official vehicle to the nearest hospital where he will be seen by a person, a doctor, uh, who will be taking all the precautions. And then we will be collecting the smear, the, the throat swab and the oropharyngeal swab. And if he finds that he need not be in the hospital for any reason, he will be sent back to the home for quarantine again till the results come. And, and this practice is uh, now followed for uh, all international travelers who are coming to us and or anybody who is uh, having any respiratory symptoms and of all the primary and secondary contacts. And that is where, you know, we succeeded in identifying a large number of contacts, even though these three people were the only people who got uh, infected and came to Kerala, we could identify about uh, more than 3000 contacts who are actually the primary and secondary contacts of these individuals. And they are all in quarantine now. Almost 100% they are in quarantine and they are not permitted to mix with other people. And fortunately, because of the because the administration was very good, the second thing that we did was the second uh, most accepted uh, methodology of containing the epidemic. And that was uh, social distancing. All the schools are closed immediately and uh, all celebrations all festivals all ceremonies including even marriages funerals everywhere you know the instruction was given that there is not going to be a collection of more than 50 people in any place and uh, you know uh, we ensured that this is being uh, this is happening and you know if you if if uh, you have a chance to look around the videos that are being seen uh, shown by the kerala media you can see that most of the roads are deserted most of the buses have no passengers and, and people are remaining confined to their houses, homes. Uh, and along with that, we also did uh, the, 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 uh, the containment health measures, the infection control measures like, you know, popularization of hand washing and, uh, and maintaining the social distance wherever, you know, people are getting, uh, you know, uh, gathering for some purpose. And now yesterday only our health minister has launched the 
the hand washing campaign which we call as the break the chain campaign where you know people are asked to do hand washing with soap and water as much as possible and you know use uh, sanitizers in those instances where soap and water is not available so kerala generally has uh, a, a tendency uh, that the people are more hygienic they have the habit of taking bath regularly and so this hand washing uh, you know is becoming a, 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 a traditional thing now in kerala as far as uh, you know the spread of the disease is concerned and then there the, we had the healthcare workers you know the peripheral healthcare workers who were following up on the grassroots level they had an idea as to you know how many people are coming to their area from outside how many people are working how many people are studying abroad so their machinery also was activated immediately so that you know anybody coming to a village from outside kerala the the healthcare worker will immediately send it and then he will report he or she will report it to the higher authorities and there is a regular control room working in every district and the taluka level where anybody anybody who is uh, finding that somebody who is coming from outside is also moving around he will be spotted immediately and anybody who is coming from outside is is offered all the services he has the liberty to call the uh, doctors also in many places and we have started a tele consulting service in our state so that he need not go out of his house and all these uh, phone numbers and all those things are now published and it's available in the newspapers and uh, media Uh, that way you know almost i must say a good number of uh, kerala population really knows how to handle uh, in a situation if somebody comes from outside or if somebody falls sick uh, you know uh, we also we also started the uh, awareness campaigns through online media through whatsapp you know most of the keralites these days have a mobile in their hand and a good number of them are connected to various whatsapp groups so there were whatsapp oriented messages whatsapp uh, routed messages which went to lot of people about what to do when to do how to do and things like that and also about some do's and don'ts also uh, when people are there in the quarantine and fortunately we also had the the social support systems in in position so that you know those people who are in quarantine they will be in need of food they will be in need of water they will be in need of clothes and other things and they also have a psychological problem so counseling services were also immediately started so we have a tele counseling services now in position and the food and water supplies to all these people are being managed by the local self governments so i mean uh, this is perhaps the, the the maximum possible that can be done by a government or administration and the health machinery is also very active the educational institutions are all closed but uh, almost all the staff in the education institutions are now Uh, you know involved in educational activities for the people around so that is how things are progressing but i may say you know there are some loopholes but you know this is the best that we that any 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 democratic civilization can do nowadays so that is what we are doing right now yeah thank thank you so much for that overview and uh, i'm sure it will be a you know a, quite a learning experience for other states and other uh, people from other countries who are watching this so um uh, we, we have been hearing a lot about uh, that for example the mean age of uh, people who died of coronavirus uh, disease in italy was 81 but um, they were testing they were looking at uh, coronavirus in uh, se- senior citizens and senior citizens had other conditions as well in italy and uh, there was another paper which i was looking at where 30% of uh, the people with coronavirus disease were under 30 and they were uh, like carriers of coronavirus so uh, in india also we are looking at people who are coming from the 12 or uh, other high risk countries and uh, those who have symptoms so both of these conditions have to meet for the coronavirus testing so so what is the message for the general population are elderly more at risk or are people with other non communicable diseases like cardiovascular diseases etc they are more at risk what about hiv or any other correlation so uh, great to hear your insights on this sir. yeah uh, you know it has been an observation which is shared by all the countries that uh, uh, coronavirus behaves a slightly different in this context you know earlier uh, you know any new virus infection whether it is nipa virus whether it is chikungunya virus or dengue virus we always had this situation that the extremes of age were affected in most instances that means the elderly people as well as the youngsters were involved more but here is a special situation where we find that the youngsters are not getting involved that much actually you know uh, there are lots of theories and other things which are being propagated but nothing has been substantiated so far 
but uh, the, the fact remains that children are not getting infected that frequently. In fact, we also noticed that among the families where uh, HIV, where, where uh, you know, syrup, uh, I mean, uh, positives are there for uh, uh, corona, the children are not that frequently affected. Somehow they, uh, the virus doesn't like to infect children, I don't know why. Uh, but uh, it's actually the, the elderly that, uh, you know, is creating problems everywhere now because they are uh, becoming uh, sick much faster and a good number of uh, already in them, including diabetes, hypertension, serious disease and the mortality is also pretty high in them. The mortality, if you look at the international figures, you can find that the mortality for uh, the, the general population is to the tune of around 3%. Whereas the mortality for uh, you know, children is actually nearing almost zero and uh, the mortality for people above the age of uh, 70, 80 is going to be much, much higher, almost approaching 30 to 40 percent. So that is a frightening uh, thing. Uh, and, and, and add to this the fact that anytime any one of these people get the disease, their original comorbidity also becomes serious. And that makes the management very, very difficult. And another thing, you know, which, uh, you know, which has not been uh, substantiated in the case of coronavirus is the fact that the virus also will get a uh, tendency to become more virulent if it enters the body of an immunosuppressed person. We found that the transmissibility or the infectivity of the virus literally gets uh, augmented uh, when the body's immune systems are not fighting against the virus. So that also may be one of the reasons why these people are becoming sicker. And, uh, you know, naturally the spread by these people are going to be more significant in the coming days. If a child develops coronavirus or if a middle-aged person develops coronavirus, probably, you know, it might disappear just like a common cold or something. May not produce much problems. And that's why, you know, sometimes we are also talking about the prioritization of management for these people uh, to be taken care of. And that is perhaps one of the reasons suggested that Italy is having such large number. Because they have a a pretty high geriatric population in their country. So obviously, yes, your answer is your your, your query is perfect uh, because this is a observation which is shared all across the world. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sajit Kumar. And uh, before we open up for questions and friends, uh, please keep sending your questions uh, using the. Uh, chat box in the Zoom, or you can also leave your comment on the Facebook Live, and we will take as much as possible. Uh, uh, so, so before we open it, sir, so what are, can you give us your, some message for the general population, like in terms of prevention, anything which you might have left? There are this panic buying, Dr. Krupti also. Well, we'd like to hear from you both about uh, your key messages about uh, to, to, to the people, to general population in terms of prevention, in terms of contact tracing, in terms of what to do, what symptoms to look for specifically and seek help for. And also please address the panic buying of masks and sanitizers, which is happening. So maybe since you already are there, sir, so Dr. Sajid Kumar. Yeah. Uh, uh, I hope Trupti is also there in this group, okay. <laughs> Yes, yes, I will go to, to our right after this and then open it's okay, it for it's okay, yeah. it's okay, it's okay. Now, now what, I was, what I was about to say was that, you know, there is a panic buying of masks. People are becoming, you know, really panicked about this thing. Uh, the first and foremost thing, you know, people are worried about is that uh, people have had the notion that there is no treatment for coronavirus, which in fact, uh, uh, you know, I would say that uh, management of coronavirus is infection is not that difficult. It's almost like managing any other case of common cold except that you know, people who develop some respiratory problems, ARDS, requiring intubation, requiring uh, you know, some other sub major supportive measures. But for that, uh, the management of coronavirus is not that difficult. If we get coronavirus also, we still, our health system can manage you as a patient. That is the first and foremost thing which I would like to share with uh, you know, the general public who, uh, who are really panicked about, you know, if I get coronavirus, am I going to die? No, 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 it's not going to happen like that. Uh, but people who are elderly, people who are having comorbidities must always be worried about it. And they must, as much as possible, be protected by the rest of the population, by the rest of the community. So that is one thing. Second thing is about the mass. You know, there have been uh, so many graphics which are being circulated in WhatsApp and other media, you know, of people wearing masks and going around with the masks everywhere. In fact, uh, I would say that, you know, if you, if you 
if you ask me uh, my personal uh, opinion is that the masks are something which have to be used only inside the hospitals and outside the hospital the use of mask must be restricted particularly to sick persons and ill persons and with an idea of uh, their spreading uh, they are they are not spreading the the, the droplets and uh, infection to others rather than you know protecting ourselves the masks to a large extent do not prevent you from getting airborne infections that is the uh, hard truth that we must realize the purpose of a, a person wearing a mask is particularly to prevent the droplets from that person going outside and contaminating the environment and infecting others so my my you know uh, directive perhaps would be to ensure that all sick persons use the mask somebody who is having a respiratory problem coughing and sneezing is the person who must use the mask and uh, if everybody in the population is going after the mask you know something that is expected is bound to happen and that is going to be pilferage of mask hoarding and uh, scarcity of mask and you know ultimately people who really need mask inside the healthcare environments will will uh, face a severe shortage of the mask and inside the hospital also you know we have i've been talking to my students the other day inside the hospital also uh, you know if some if you are not working very close to a patient for example you are happening uh, to be sitting near a patient uh, and the, and the distance that is mentioned is 1 meter so if you are closer than 1 meter to a patient for some specific procedures that is the only time you have to wear the mask compulsory on the other hand i would be happy if i see all patients who are having some respiratory problems inside the hospitals as well as outside the hospitals wearing the mask so in fact one of the first recommendation that we give to our doctors is to ensure that if a patient comes to you and you find that this patient can transmit an infection to you the first thing to do is to give a mask to the patient first it's not that you put the mask first you put give a patient mask to the patient first and ensure that he is wearing the mask throughout his stay in the hospital and that is perhaps the 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 best way by which we can prevent a large number of infections and you now everybody knows now these days so i don't have to you know explain in detail we have got some mask called as n95 mask which are actually a filter mask air filter mask which is also called as a respirator mask and these masks are to be specifically used only when uh, you know you are doing an aerosol generating procedure with the patients or perhaps when you are going closer than 1 meter to a patient who already is diagnosed as having coronavirus infection that means only in the isolation areas only in the critical care areas and only in those areas where some procedures are to be done these are the areas where n95 mask must be used in all other places the usual surgical mask the three triple layer mask or two double layer mask is good enough and we don't anticipate that the whole population will require mask in our country to ward off the corona epidemic and if the whole population is going to use the mask it's going to be a very troublesome affair in on various grounds it's not just on medical grounds alone but on various grounds but if you are very keen you know you want to ensure that you are also not spreading the infection to others and you ensure that you don't want to get the infection from others one way which we suggest is to use a cloth a cloth what we call as the towel revolution we, we we can ask the people to use the towel and the towel you know most of you must have seen people who are traveling on the scooters wearing the towel you know to protect themselves from the dust so just like that if you use a towel a, a towel which is folded in two and then put over the face and mouth or to cover the nose and mouth that itself is good enough to prevent the infection to others and i would rather say that this way of using a towel across your face will also protect you a lot because that will prevent your hands from carrying the viruses to your mouth and nose so that will act as something like a, a, a barrier which prevents your hands and nose from coming to the mouth and nostrils very frequently and that is one thing you know which can definitely benefit uh, the, the 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 prevention activities and other than that you know i i would suggest don't go for the mask in fact uh, more than the mask what you need is hand washing and we'll discuss about hand washing a few minutes later yep thank you so much thank you and dr tripti gilada bahiti uh, let us hear from you also your final message before we open up for the question and answer uh, we just saw a lot of uh, prevention messages in your hindi video and also uh, on other uh, public broadcasts so over to you dr tripti yes so uh, like really well explained by dr sajit kumar that masks is like a panic statement 
and it really isn't needed to be used by everyone uh, especially the general public and there are very very few indications for when you should use a mask and uh, the most second most important thing being hand hygiene and cuff etiquettes and i think this these are the two things that we need to start practicing and teach our patients our relatives our friends again and again is to uh, hand wash regularly and uh, with other than the mask the other thing that is really having stock outs is alcohol hand rubs or sterilium uh, but we all forget that soap and water works better than the alcohol hand rub hand rubs so soap and water work equally really well in fact better we only need to make sure that the hands are washed perfectly at least for 20 seconds there are seven steps of hand washing which are available the figure is available online which covers different parts of the hand that usually are not washed when we tend to wash quickly with water so between the fingers the nails the back of the hands the wrists the thumb this is something that we all do but we forget to do the back of the hands between the fingers so i think practicing that consciously so that it eventually becomes a subconscious practice for all of us and stopping the habit of touching our faces our mouth nose and eyes again and again with unwashed hands so if we take care of the cuff etiquette hand hygiene not touching the face and the people who actually are ill start using masks start staying at home and uh, stop and that, so the infection is stopped at the source itself i think will really do a lot to the uh, uh, spread of the epidemic the third most important thing that is being promoted in a very big way is social distancing and i think that is one thing that all of us need to understand uh, a lot of people think that social distancing or what social distancing actually means is maintaining a distance of 6 feet from people who have respiratory symptoms but also maintaining a distance of 6 feet from general public which means in india if you were to say maintain a distance of 6 feet from someone else means stay back at home and that's exactly that is being suggested is if there is something essential step out of your house if there is something non essential please stay back at home and in essential there are only three things that are essential one is getting food two is work and the third is accessing healthcare other than these three things everything falls into an unessential which it could be going out onto playgrounds theaters malls anyway the theaters and the malls are closed in many of the states and uh, avoiding public gatherings even group of people because we do not know who has picked up virus from where who is uh, asymptomatic who is a asymptomatic carrier who is in the incubation period and is already spreading the virus so the entire concept of social distancing is not to create panic it's in fact to prevent a panic like situation in the country so if social distancing is really followed very religiously by everyone in the country we will avert a calamity that italy is facing so it's only a matter of two or three weeks where we really need to stop the cut down on meeting different people and being at places where you will be in contact with things that a lot of people touch and if we can really um, flatten the curve so uh, in every epidemic there is a curve where uh, the curve starts and each country reaches a peak number of cases if the num- if the number of people meeting each other decreases which will eventually happen because of social distancing then the peak that a country reaches slowly comes down and that is what we want to achieve it's not that india is not going to get a peak we are going to get a peak number of cases it's not that our cases are going to stop we know that these cases are going to keep increasing in the next few weeks it's just that we don't want a really big rise or a really big peak which means if we have a really big peak we know that 80% of the patients who get infected with corona virus will recover by themselves but there are 20% of these individuals who will require health care in hospitals or clinics or nursing homes and we understand that if a huge number of a population actually gets infected our health care is going to be overburdened taking care even of those 20% of the patients we we will not be able to fulfill those needs and that is where we will start seeing an increased mortality rate so the entire aim 
for the next two or three weeks is practicing the personal protective measures, but also staying home as far as possible and only getting out for essential activities so that each of us helps to break that link in transmission and flatten that peak for the epidemic. Thank you. So uh, now opening up for the questions. Uh, I'll, uh, yeah. So there is a question from Dr. Rishi Kumar Saxena. Let's take this first. Uh, he's a chess specialist from UP. And he has said that uh, so far, uh, the, the, CO, the COVID cases are from countries which are low TB burden. And he's saying that, is, is there any correlation of tuberculosis and COVID-19 as both are spread by aerosol and are serious cases in 70 plus with comorbidity of uh, NCDs, diabetes, hypertension, chronic respiratory diseases. So Dr. Sajid Kumar and Dr. Trupti Gilada, do you, is there any evidence? Are we seeing any correlation between tuberculosis and COVID-19? So both of these are uh, respiratory diseases, but there is no correlation between uh, a country having low number of cases of TB and higher number of uh, cases of COVID. In fact, uh, the countries that are slowly picking up are countries where there are a lot of international travelers. And that is how this disease has moved from one country to the other is because of international travel and a lot of tourists. In fact, what we should remember is countries that have a high TB burden are countries that will be worst hit by respiratory diseases. Because uh, the spread of TB reflects the general practice of the public. So people not used to co covering their cough or spitting in public are also the major risk factors for transmission of any respiratory illness. So it's all the more of a bigger concern that given our general public practices, we know that it is extremely difficult for our to get our people to follow cough etiquettes and hand hygiene. And we will have to be even more alert. In fact, we are hoping that with this entire uh, uprise and this entire increase in general awareness for these basic practices that we should have even otherwise practiced, we hope that at least that, that will be the silver lining to the COVID-19 uh, cloud is that over a period of time, people will get so used to following good practices that we will start seeing a decrease in respiratory cases and in TB cases eventually. And almost all cases related to sanitation and uh, human behaviors. They're all likely to come, you know, because COVID is actually teaching us good lessons. Just like uh, HIV and hepatitis, we had taught us something about infection control. So this is actually teaching us about some health habits in the community as such. Absolutely. So true, so true. And uh, let's hope that in future we do see a decline in so many other infectious diseases with the more uptake and, uh, you know, more public awareness about uh, health practices and health issues. Uh, there is another question from Shimona Kanwar, and she sent there are two actually. Any trials found successful for drugs or vaccines against COVID? And the second one is why? Uh, when is it predicted to decline? And then I think you both have answered the second part as to, as to the best of what we know right now. But are there any trials for vaccines uh, or and or drugs going on currently? I think there are, so there are a lot of okay, I'm sorry. yeah, Dr. Tripti, please go ahead and we'll, we'll uh, go to Dr. Sajid Kumar. Okay. So there are a lot of ongoing trials in uh, China and also in Italy, where they are trying over a half a dozen drugs that they think would work in COVID-19. At this point in time, we do not have any efficacy or safety results of, from any of these trials. So all the drugs that we plan to use in case COVID-19 hits India badly are only based on uh, case reports or anecdotal uh, reports that we've received from these countries. And uh, a lot of people have read about uh, HIV medication, lopinavir, retonavir, which might be helpful in COVID-19. In fact, ICMR did receive an approval from DCGI to use this drug in case it needs to be used in uh, complicated cases. But as of now, to give a very pointed answer of is there a proven efficacy or safety trial for any other for any drug in COVID-19, the answer is no. 
it will take us at least a few more months for these results to be available uh, at the same time there isn't a vaccine that is available yet and we think that the vaccine is going to take us at least another year because even the vaccine has to undergo a trial to show that it is effective and these trials do take a long time it's not like over a month that the results will be available thank you dr sajit kumar you will like to add something no no the same thing you know uh, there have been lot of anecdotal reports but uh, now when we actually go into the mechanism of action of many of these drugs uh, uh, it, it's really blank we don't have any idea about you know, even if somebody says that this drug works we do not know how it works you know unless we know how it works in, in many instances it's going to be very difficult because this is not a retrovirus to try the you don't know the uh, transcriptase inhibitors or the protease inhibitors and uh, this is not a, 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 anything anywhere near uh, the other uh, mechanisms of actions of chloroquine or any other molecule that has been tried so these are all just anecdotal reports and in fact you know uh, i would rather be a little more skeptical i would take all these things with a pinch of salt because we know that a large number of people with corona recover even without anything only by supportive measures and only by you know symptomatic management a good number of them are bound to recover so at that stage whether we do not know whether it's actually the effect of any of these drugs or so and as the peers rightly said you know before we actually say that a drug works and a drug can be given to others there are a lot of steps to be taken before we actually you know throw it out into the scientific community as such and then only after being open in the scientific community only this can be given to the public so it's likely to take a minimum of 6 to 9 months before we will be able to get anything that is going to be useful whether it is a drug or a vaccine and uh, uh, i don't think uh, you know we can wait till that time so right now our focus has to be on containment and prevention and and good supportive care as much as possible right thank you absolutely right now prevention is the is the vaccine we really should do let's so we do a good job there friends please keep another, sending another, the questions we have some more time left now yes. another point about the vaccine you know most of the times what happens is these viruses are not uh, you know that stable also by the time you develop the vaccine and make it available to others the virus will is more intelligent and i am sure it would have changed its habits and uh, its chemical nature but sometimes these viruses become the vaccines literally become useless also so that is also another uh, proposition that you know we have to be handling uh, we we cannot invest that much into the virus vaccine development but obviously definitely the vaccine will definitely be of help but that's not going to be the solution for the time being in anyway. it right that's a very important point uh, dr sajit kumar because uh, vac- you know we often uh, 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 in such a pand- cases of pandemics we do focus so much on treatment and diagnostic but often prevention takes the back seat prevention must take uh, get due attention uh, definitely Uh, there is a question from Dr. Tin Muang Hatwe uh, from Yanwal, Doctor. But I see him online. Dr. Tin Muang, will you like to ask a question? Should I read it out? All right. Anyways, so Dr. Tin Muang Hatwe uh, is the uh, editor of Health Digest Journal in Myanmar, Burma, and he has sent three questions. What are the possible reasons for uh, no COVID-19 positive cases in Myanmar and Laos? the second is do you think to give update training for sample collectors in these countries i don't think this is a question for this forum but we can still uh, we, uh, seek your insights and uh, the third is is there any other way is there any other way to test for covid apart from pcr so what are the possible reasons for no covid 19 in myanmar and laos second is do you think uh, do you, can we give updated training for sample collectors in myanmar and laos and um, uh, is there any other way to test for covid-19 apart from pcr and friends please keep uh, we, we're running, there are hardly 4 5 minutes left if you all any one of you would like to speak on zoom please let me know on zoom and or and those of you who are watching on facebook if there is any pressing question left please type it in the comment box thanks over to you both dr yeah, sajid kumar dr tripti yeah, yeah okay yeah. see the 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 issue is i am i am not very uh, i know aware of what is happening in myanmar right now but uh, there is a possibility that if a country right now doesn't have that many corona virus cases anywhere in the world uh, there are two reasons for that one is obviously that you know the travelers are not uh, frequenting that place that frequently and maybe because you know 
uh, there are some pre some predilections for people to travel from one country to another and maybe i don't know myanmar may not be in that chain or uh, that trajectory straight away that may be one of the reasons and the second reason is perhaps uh, you know uh, the, the, we are not picking up enough number of cases that may be another reason because we you know in kerala also where we are doing all this screening and testing and all these things we are very aware well aware that you know there are so many missed cases that are likely to be there a large number of cases are likely to be missed because many of them are likely to be asymptomatic and you will pick up these cases only when they reach actually a, 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 a level beyond somewhere close to the peak only you will start seeing cases with no connections to travel and other things so uh, you know that is one thing which we have to be very careful about before we say that you know we have got less number of cases in a place and uh, uh, regarding the testing and other things i, I think prithvi will be able to highlight much better so i, yes, I agree with uh, yeah so i agree with uh, what dr uh, sajit kumar had to say about why there aren't cases we also need to understand that the density of that the population density of that country is 1/6 or 1/5 of the population density of india or lot of other countries so um, even though they haven't seen cases now we know that eventually over a period of time each country is going to see some cases here and there so it's not that they will never see a case it's just a matter of time that it will uh, we only we only hope that the subsequent countries don't get the peak that the other country earlier countries have because by then they would have learned their lesson from a lot of other countries and they would have been better prepared and the epidemic will not take them by surprise uh the second question was about do the uh, labs in myanmar need to be trained is that the question yes uh, for sample collectors so, can uh, so, uh, so who or world health organization has very standardized guidelines for collecting samples for uh, all laboratory assays and these are very widely available the the procedure isn't difficult so uh, i don't think there is some additional training that any any other country needs over and above what who has suggested and uh, the only test that is available to us for covid 19 is the pcr based assay and this pcr so pcr based assays are they pick up antigens and usually pcr based assays are pretty much some of the best tests that are available for any disease for that matter so these uh, tests are done on nasopharyngeal swabs or swabs taken from the throat or if someone has a cough or if someone is on the ventilator or intubated then the secretions from the chest are sent for these testing we also know that they are collecting blood samples um they they probably are also doing pcr test on the blood samples even though the throat and the respiratory secretions will be the first ones to show the pcr there aren't any other test available at least in my knowledge other than the pcr uh, dr sajit kumar do you think there are any other test other than the pcr assays for uh, covid 19 that's all that we've heard here in mumbai yeah yeah right now i think it's only the pcr that is reliable and that is uh, able to give us a result but we are working on some antibody tests you know which obviously will take some more time and you will not be able to pick up the initial cases at least by an antibody test uh but right now i think i uh, well health organization as well as cdc and various other organizations have categorically stated that proof of infection is only a, a pcr positivity right now okay thank you uh, there are two questions which i see in the question box so although it's uh, uh, we have, we have, we, have, we have about a minute past the uh, uh duration but still i think dr uh, sorry rania khauri from jordan she has written a comment that we are a preventative health non profit in jordan and jordan yesterday declared a close down for two weeks of schools prayer places clubs and they stopped all large social gatherings i think this is one of the uh, things which had come up and both experts had uh, commented upon it for the importance of social distancing and let's hope um, uh, these prevention measures work rania thanks for sharing dr ps uh, sharma who is a tb physician from uh, andhra pradesh has written a role of homeo medicines question mark so will you like uh, both of you like to comment on this role of homeo medicines homeopathy medicines so at this point there is no proof that any homeopathy allopathy or ayurvedic or yoga or exercises have any role on prevention of coronavirus 
um, the best that they can do is help in whatever health needs, but they are not going to specifically prevent coronavirus. In fact, we must dissuade people from sending these forwards and sending this uh, a lot of myth about a lot of these medications being helpful for coronavirus because it will only make people using these drugs more complacent and will cause a complete failure of the entire prevention strategy that this country is headed for. So there is no role of homeopathic medicines uh, at this point in our knowledge that can prevent or treat coronavirus. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Sajid Kumar, any... Yeah, any this, this, this brings us to the point of, uh, you know, misinformation that is happening across the, the media and the world at large. In fact, you know, uh, we Indians have a habit of believing whatever is told by the Westerners. And there have a lot of misinformation which happens even from the Westerners' mouths about these uh, uh, issues. And I think uh, spreading of uh, misinformation is something which is to be viewed with uh, serious uh, concern. And uh, at least at least the, the, the people who are in the health field or the medical field should uh, uh, stick on to only scientific materials being shared. And unnecessary scientific material, unnecessary so-called pseudo-scientific material should not be shared. And as I said before, you know, coronavirus infection is something from which people will come out without any problem, uh, only with supporting measures. So there can be so many, you know, uh, people who are likely to take the credit for all these uh, natural things that are happening. So we must be very careful about these uh, instances and uh, make sure that only scientific information gets spread across. Even there are some information, you know, regarding prevention and other things, like, you know, you drink more of more water, you know, the water will flush away all your coronaviruses from the throat. And people are telling that, you know, you stand up for the sun and coronaviruses will be destroyed. So many, so many misconceptions and so many, you know, uh, pseudoscience is spreading around. So we have to be very, very careful about that. And any discussion on coronavirus control at this time should also focus on uh, avoiding and preventing such misinformation being spread to the people, which will actually, you know, carry the people away from uh, uh, our, our stringent public health measures, which we are adopting and which we want uh, every, every, every person in the world, at least in India and, uh, you know, in our own places to follow. So uh, that, that must be stressed, you know, in any forum. Not Well, uh, thank you. We are, we are towards the end. Is there any last word which uh, either of you would like to have before we close the session? And thanks a lot for staying a little bit longer. Dr. Tripti, anything, uh, any final word? I think we have the next three weeks to really change this epidemic in our favor. And uh, it's not just the government. I think all of us will have to play our role in individual, in institutional capacity. And um, the media will have a very major role in disseminating the right information and getting people to understand why these measures have been suggested. A lot of time these measures are only suggested, but people don't know why. So they only think it's a panic reaction. So I think uh, the media will be able to really play a very important role in helping people understand why the government or why these policies need to be followed and hopefully we wouldn't have a bad situation in our country if we really do the things that they should be done for the next three or four weeks. Yeah. Thanks. Let, let's hope that happens. And Dr. Sajid Kumar, uh, will you like Yeah. Uh, now, I think, I think uh, you know, as is the case with most of the diseases, I think uh, here again, you know, we are uh, reaching the final stage where human behavior is going to be the most important thing as far as control of this disease is concerned. Human behavior, including uh, travel, human behavior, including uh, uh, you know, one's own responsibility to others, and human behavior, uh, including uh, knowing the right thing and spreading the right thing. So I think uh, that way, this is going to be one disease which will definitely help us shape the behavior in, uh, in our population much, to a much higher and healthy levels. I hope that works. Absolutely, I mean, and let's hope it works. And uh, thank you so much again, Dr. R. Sajid Kumar uh, from uh, Kottayam Government Medical College. He's a professor and head of the Infectious Diseases Department. And uh, Dr. Tripti Gilada Bahiti, infectious disease expert from Mumbai Unison Medicare and Research Center. Thank you to both of you. Thank you to big, all big, of the panelists. So, big, big. And, Namaste. Uh, Namaste. 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 Yes, sir. Namaste, of course. Of course, thank of course. You. Thanks a lot to each of the 
participants also and those who are watching on facebook and tomorrow at uh, at 2:30 pm india time we will have the asia pacific conference on reproductive and sexual health and rights dialogues apcr which are dialogues on hiv and uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights so do join us there i will share the link the recording the podcast etc will be sent to all those who have registered and will also be made available in the public domain thank you again and let's please all of you stay safe and healthy thank you thank you thank yeah, you for the thanks opportunity thank you dr yeah. sajit kumar thank you dr kripti thank you bye